Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Calloway, but everybody calls me Spot. It's not an insult, I swear. It's cool. Um, I am someone that has been in open source for a very long time, uh, 20 plus years at this point. I started my work in the Fedora community at Red Hat, and I'm currently an open source strategist at Amazon Web Services. Um, what that means in practice is that my job is to be an advocate for open source within the company and outside the company, talking to communities, talking to people, talking to projects, helping them understand how they can work together, how they can work with us, how we can all help succeed together. Um, so it's really more of an advocate role. But as part of that role, I spend time talking to managers who don't always understand why they should care about open source. Um, now, it's worthy to point out that there's a lot of different motivations for writing open source software, and every company's motivations are going to be different. So this is very sort of generalized advice. Um, you shouldn't interpret it as, these are all the things I learned from talking to AWS managers. You shouldn't say, well, these will all work in my situation. You want to sort of keep an open mind, think about that, figure out what will work for your specific scenario, and go from there. These slides were originally written by Rich Bowen a very smart, very excellent speaker who unfortunately got double booked on this and asked me if I would step in and present his content. So I remixed it a little bit. Um, but if you want to see his original slides without my remix changes and the pictures of his beautiful children, uh, <laughs> you can go and check that out at that link. Now, I've been relatively privileged in that I've always had the luxury of working with people who are as passionate about open source as I am. Um, and that's still true at AWS. My team is still made up of a lot of people that really deeply believe in open source. Um, but at a large scale company, I'm spending a lot of time talking to people who want to use terms like ROI. And I'm like, but I just want to go and write code. Can I please just go do that again? And they're like, no, 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 that's not what you do anymore. Uh, so high level agenda, you, like I, probably care about open source. Your manager cares about results. Now, it's important to realize these things are not in conflict. Uh, we all would like to continue to be paid to do open source things. Whatever your open source thing is, whatever your angle on open source is, you want to continue to get paid to do that. I think that's a relatively universal truth. If anybody here does not want to get paid to do their open source thing, there are other sessions down the hall. You can just check those out. Uh, but you also want your company to think positively about this. They don't want to see you doing that open source thing and think, wow, I wish that person would really stop doing that open source thing and do more of the things we care about. So it's really your job to persuade management to see open source engagements as something that has value attached to it. You want your company to do open source correctly and you want your company to succeed taking that out to a higher level. So ideally, you care about the success of your company. I've worked at enough places that I know this isn't always true, but let's assume for the purposes of this discussion that you do care about the success of your company. Um, having that company have a solid and correct understanding of open source is something that you can contribute back to that company and give it what it needs to have that be a long-term success. It's for your company, but it's also for you and your career, because if you succeed at this, lots of other companies will find you interesting and want to, to come and do the same sort of work for them. I came to AWS after 19 years at Red Hat, and it was an opportunity to take what I had learned and practiced at Red Hat to an entirely larger problem set, a much broader set of problems. At Red Hat, we defaulted to open. No one at AWS defaults to open. It's just not the way that they're built. It's not the way that they're structured. This doesn't mean that open source doesn't have a good place, a home, an opportunity inside of AWS, but it's a very different structure. Now, here's a meta reason <laughs> that I want you to care. Uh, for those of you who don't recognize the save icon that I've tiled out here, um, these are floppies. Uh, computers used to save things on them. Uh, in the long, long ago. Um, when these floppies were new, when you installed operating system software using these floppies, uh, open source was not 
part of a standard business deployment. You might find a little tucked in the corner over here. You might find a little Apache web server running in the back. You might find a little send mail off in the corner. You might find some new utilities running on some Unix machines, but it wasn't like it is today. In the last decade, open source has become critical to all businesses. Companies are treating it like a product to consume rather than a project to sustain or participate in. It's just a thing that we use. We have open source, we got it. Here it is, open source, open source, open source. They're just consuming it. Even if they don't necessarily know they're consuming it, they are. So you want to ask the question, why do you, human, talking to a manager, why do you do open source? There's a lot of different answers that you hear for this. Maybe you do it because it's fun. Maybe you're scratching an itch that you have. You have a problem. You're solving it with open source. Maybe you're doing open source to spend time talking to other people that have similar interests. Maybe you want to give back. Maybe you feel like you want to invest something into something that gave you value. Maybe you want to make the world a better place. Humanitarian reasons are valid. Maybe you're just trying to build a resume. Maybe you're trying to learn a technology. Maybe it's your job. A couple years ago, opensource.com did a survey and asked that specific question. And the main reasons that people answered in the survey, and again, limited sample set, doesn't necessarily reflect everyone. Um, the biggest reason was to learn something new or to get a career opportunity out of it. The second biggest reason was because it's fun. Anyone who has ever participated in a rather contentious issue report knows that the fun stops at some point, but there is fun to be had on open source and in communities when they're done well. And then altruism was the third reason, that people really did want to make things better. They wanted to improve. Now, the great thing about this event and other events like it is that all the people here can sit around this campfire and speak a common language. We all talk open source. I say GitHub, I say issue, I say pull request. We all know what I'm talking about. I say troll, we all know what I'm talking about. And we have these stories about corporate types, you know, the suits in the back that are not in this room right now that just don't get it. And we laugh at them and we go, yeah, yeah they're going to be, you know. <laughs> That doesn't help anything. It's true, and it's fun, and we should all do it still. I'm not taking that away from you, but it doesn't really solve any of our problems. That's not why your company does open source. These things are why your company does open source. Roughly in this order, profit. Companies pretty much do everything for profit. Um, and then they also do things for their customers because their customers give them profit. Uh, and then they do things for their shareholders because their shareholders ensure that they have customers that they can get profit from. And then profit again because we want to re-emphasize that that's really important to companies. Uh, and then maybe your employees have a say in this if you're lucky. But I want to clarify here that your company doesn't mean the same thing when they talk about doing open source as you would as an individual. When they say we do open source. It could mean contributing to a project. It could mean open sourcing something they have internally. It could mean taking an open source thing and forking it into something that no longer recognizes and it looks even remotely similar to what it started out as. It could be building products with open source software, either admitting that they're open source or not. All of these things could be possible. Now, this is not your manager, but it is my manager. Um, I'm sure that you have a wonderful manager who understands open source. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. But somewhere up the management chain, past my lovely manager, is someone with different priorities who doesn't think about open source like we do at all, possibly. So when you are talking to management about open source, it is critical that you speak their language. Now, I'm going to speak to this in sort of an engineering context. You would not try to explain a technical problem to a community that is Python-based in Java. That's not going to help them. They're going to stare at you funny. And maybe you'll get lucky and find someone who understands what you're trying to say. But if you come with sample code in Python, they'll be like, oh, no, no, I, I see what we're trying to get at here. 
The same sort of logic applies to speaking to managers. Now, this isn't lying. I'm not advocating that you just make up words and come in and be like, yo, so we're going to shift our paradigm and put that in a box and have a one-on-one, -on -one and I'm going to ping you on that later. That's not what I'm talking about. This is translation. Open source is practical. Now, I think that it's an objectively better way to build software, and what is good for the customer is generally the right thing to do. Your manager probably doesn't think about any of those things, and your manager's manager definitely doesn't. And the higher up in the food chain you get, you less of that happens. You want to understand where they are coming from so that you can help them understand where you are coming from. And in that act of translation between the two, you bridge that gap. So you want to practice being a translator. Or you can just get one of those AI LLMs to do it for you and just type in what I should say to my manager about open source. See how that goes, let me know. Now, it would be reductionist to say that your company only cares about profits. As pointed out, it's more complicated, but it's still this. It's still this. One of the biggest mistakes that people make when they try doing this the first time is that they make it about philosophy. Now, this is Open Sources. It's an older book, but it's an excellent book. It came out right when the movement sort of started becoming something that wasn't laughed at, and people were like, wow, this actually is changing things. It's a fascinating read. I highly encourage you to pick it up if you haven't looked at it. But don't quote from this book to your manager. Don't make a philosophical pitch. Your manager doesn't care about licenses. Your manager doesn't care about free versus open. <laughs> they don't want to hear about the philosophical differences in the FSF's movement to free the software and to free culture. They don't care. And maybe, maybe you're lucky and they will care, but you don't want to do this in like a first conversation. This ought to be something that you bring up like years later after they've already bought into this open source work. Jargon is another big thing you want to try to avoid. The language that we use in communities when we're talking about these sorts of things are often languages that they just don't speak. You know, keep it simple. Break that language down to something that you could tell to anyone and they would understand. My job is as an open source strategist. I build strategy planning documents to help teams be effective in working with upstream open source communities. Did anyone in the room not understand what I just said? Cool. Everyone in the outside, if I went out in the building and said that on the street, it would blow their minds. They would not know what I just said to them in the slightest. So I would need to break that down more simply and say, I help teams work with other technical teams to solve shared problems. I've simplified that language down. I've taken all the jargon out of it. It's suddenly a lot more impactful. Oh yeah, no, I, I may not understand the nuances at the finest level of what that meant, but we've, we've established a common frame there. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that you don't have unlimited time with your manager and your manager's manager and your manager's manager's manager to make that point. Maybe if you're lucky, you get a minute. This is where the idea of an elevator pitch comes from, that you end up in the same elevator as this important person, and you want to make a point, and you have this limited time, and you want to make sure that you're concise and focused. You want to try to make your point, or at least persuade the person that you're talking to that the things you have to tell them are interesting enough to make more time for. Spending your time talking about free versus libre versus open versus puppies is going to work against you. And it's going to persuade this person that you're not even on the same planet as them. And they're not really interested in talking to you. They will immediately be like, yeah, that's great. You should talk to this other person six levels below me and have them figure out if you're worth time. And then when it, if it trickles back up to me, I'll come back. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that giving back is a moral obligation, I do believe in it, but your company's not a charity, unless your company is a charity, and if your company is a charity, more credit to you, thank you for that. Um, but most companies are not, and 
Management will often see open source as a renewable resource that they can take and take and take and take and take and no end in sight. That seafood buffet will never run out of shrimp. If you take the attitude that an open source contribution is a moral obligation, that we must do this for the greater good, it won't land. They won't see what the actual business benefit is to doing that. And that sounds terrible for me to say out loud because we would all hope that, you know, we would want our companies to think about this a little bit. But Dawn Foster has a good quote here. She said, if you talk about what you do as though it's charity, then it's going to be the first thing they cut when there are budget conversations. And if you are thinking long term about your open source engagement, you do not want to be the low hanging fruit that they go, well, that thing doesn't really actually solve any problems or help us business wise. We're just going to cut that. So what I suggest instead is that we talk about the supply chain. Now that link in the middle is actually XZ. Um, and that's the only reference I'll make to that. But uh, so why is giving back the right thing to do? Because you derived good and value from it and should nurture it in return. Not because of a moral obligation, but because of sustainability. Your manager probably really likes talking about the supply chain. Your manager's manager probably really likes talking about it too. Now, maybe if you're lucky, they read an article about S-bombs and they've been looking for an opportunity to use that word in a conversation because they think that that will make them really feel like they're connecting with their technical teams. They probably don't know what an S-bomb is. They're probably really wondering if they need to get somebody on staff that can defuse S-bombs. Uh, but fundamentally, when you use a resource, when you take on a dependency, you need to ensure that that dependency is still around next year, that it's still there as the thing continues to go on. How much is your company betting on something that depends on open source? Is it millions? Is it billions? Is it more? Shouldn't they be concerned that the things that make that go exist, are healthy, are secure? are sustainable? I said millions and billions, and I'm hand-waving because I'm using this in an abstract context, but you want to demonstrate with real numbers how this project is a critical part of your company's supply chain. Data is power here. If you can come up with a clear statistical sentence, this component is part of 72% of our products. All of a sudden, that manager is paying attention. Okay, it's really important to all of my projects. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it's important to all of my projects, but I know that it is. I have data that backs this up. Don't make up numbers. Actually get the data to back this up. Talk about supply chain horror stories. I mean, goodness knows there's enough of them out there. You can pick some ones. Find ones that are relevant to your company's situation. Did you see what happened to this other company that had this problem? I think I have a way to help us avoid that. In 10 seconds, I've gotten every manager in AWS to stop doing whatever they were doing and come listen to me. Long-term thinking. Not immediate problem. It's not this open source thing where we apply it as duct tape, we'll fix everything for us and we'll be done in the next five minutes. That's great for fixing a crisis in the immediate thing, but your managers are not going to care about that very much. You want to demonstrate to them that you're thinking big, you're thinking about the company, and you're not just thinking about the fire that is right in front of you right now. So here's some scary stories. These are a little older now. We could put some new ones on there if we wanted to, but we've, we've leave these up. I love that now our scary stories in our open source space are, are branded, that they have logos, and I can just put them up there and most of you will know what they are. Um, don't be afraid to tell those scary stories to your manager. Um, log for shell is a huge one. I think most people have heard the impact of that at this point, and if your manager's manager's manager hasn't, it's a great story to introduce them to. The list is long, but, and this is the but, 
Be sure that you communicate that in each of these cases, these scary stories came about because of minimal community engagement, not because they were open source. These things happen everywhere in software. We only hear about them and see them in the open source because of the nature of open source. Every proprietary stack is riddled with these scary stories. They're just not getting talked about. So in this presentation, like any given this space, you have the obligatory XKCD comic. I won't explain it. You've all seen it so many times, I hope. Um, but understand that your company is one of those things on the top of this stack. I've had a lot of effective success taking this graphic and labeling some of the pieces for service teams <laughs> and then putting at the top S3. <laughs> Shoring up that bottom layer isn't charity. It's an investment in keeping that top layer up. That's key that you get that message across to management. So if you're lucky enough that you can get something in front of a manager, this is sort of an example report that you could do to your manager about why it's important that you would contribute to the sustainability of a project. This is some data that talks about Apache Commons. And again, the numbers are vague and made up. The projects are vague and made up. The product is vague and made up. This is a template. But when you do it, be specific. Use real numbers. Use your real company's numbers. Tie it to a company priority. In this case, we've tied it to profitability and budget. Don't waste words on things they don't care about. We don't need to go into depth to explain all of the things that Apache Commons does. We simply state that it is a critical component in a product that made this much money. OK, I'm listening now. I'm still reading. You want to keep it short? You want to keep it focused. You want to get to the point. You want to make sure you clearly state what you want. That last sentence, it is in the best interest of our customers and on bottom line to participate in the sustainability of that project by contributing bug fixes, feature enhancements, and PR requests. Say what you want. Be specific. They can come back and say, I don't understand what any of those things are. What, help me understand what those things are. But you've already got them at that point. If they're following up to ask what those things are, they've already bought in. They, they're on the hook. Sustainability. I know that term's a little overloaded in our space, but I'm just going to keep using it because I think we all understand what I'm saying when I say it. So when something is sustainable, it has multiple vendors. It has multiple maintainers. It is responsive. Issues that are filed don't sit for years. Stakeholders participate. It's doing things. It's moving, it's evolving, it's changing, it's fixing, it's growing. That work that goes into keeping a community healthy, to keeping a community active, to keeping a community growing, we call this at AWS undifferentiated heavy lifting. But what it really means, if I simplify that out, is focus on what you're good at, and collaborate on what's common. There's always going to be things that every open source project is going to need done. Issue triage, simple bug fix, documentation, test suites. There's not an open source project on the planet that doesn't want a test suite. Single vendor projects. This is where we start talking about elephant factor. Uh, does anyone not know what I mean when I say elephant factor? Cool. So elephant factor is a metric that says how many companies do we have to count to get to 50% of the contributions on a project? That number is the elephant factor. Elephants being large animals, companies being large entities. Lots of projects have very small elephant factor numbers. 50% or more of their contributions come from a single company. And when you look at single vendor projects, you find that they tend to be primarily controlled by the priorities of that vendor. 
I mean, that sounds obvious when I say it out loud, but multiple vendor projects are insulated from vendors changing priorities. You know, like for example, if a company decides that maybe they don't want it to be open source anymore and they would like to go and pull all their extensions into a giant bundle and go off and sell it as a proprietary thing under a business source license. I mean, that never happens in real life, but if you have multiple vendors that are participating in that project, then sure, they could fork it and go off and do it in the corner, but the core project is still going, or you'll get that core project that'll go and rename itself Valky and go off and do some fun stuff elsewhere. But, you know, I, this is what it means to look at these projects and sort of understand and helping your company to understand the dependencies and the risks that they might be taking on if the elephant factor is too small. How do you mitigate elephant factor? Well, that's a whole different presentation, but thinking about what your company could do. If your company really does depend on this component in a big way and it makes them a lot of money, you might be able to make the case that you could start into having the company be more of a participant in this project to get that elephant factor number down or up as it is, and then have more players in that and make that project less risky. Same is true for single maintainer projects. This is pony factor. Ponies being small, ponies are people. The number of people it takes to get to 50% of contributions. If you ever come across a project where the pony factor is one, whew, that's scary. What happens if that person gets eaten by raptors? I mean, whew, we don't want that. That project will just stop. Having multiple maintainers protects you from skiing accidents. Now, this is my son, Jimmy. He's pretty popular in school. We have similar hair, and it's a thing. You need to remember that your company is not in the business of being popular. I, I'm allowed to say that because I work for Amazon. Um, your company is in the business of being successful. They definitely don't care if you as a person are popular. <laughs> but maybe. Popularity is a proxy for influence. And they do care about that. This is my other son, Danny. And he does not care what anyone thinks of him at any point in time. He will tell you to your face what he thinks at any moment. He's 10. He's very interested in setting the narrative. He wants to tell the story he wants to do. He wants to solve the problems he wants to solve. This is him at a, one of those fun arcade places with the tickets where he spent an hour figuring out an algorithm to beat the quick drop game and then beat it 17 times. This was his face after he figured out that he'd succeeded the first time and then he did it 16 more times and then they had to ask him to stop. <laughs> so take advantage of that. Talk about driving the project's direction on behalf of our customers. Now, is this the language that we would use with the project? No. But it's the language that your manager is going to understand. Now, be careful. You don't want someone to misconstrue the thing I just said as I'm attempting to manipulate this open source project. That is not what I'm trying to say. You want to make sure you get that clearly. If your company really doesn't understand how open source works, this might not be the best approach. Just keep it in your portfolio as an option. Don't claim that you own or lead or invented one of these open source projects that you start contributing to. Don't be like, well, we, you know, we are 100% of Apache Spark. Did you know we invented that, actually? I mean, who would do that, Redis? Um, <laughs> You want to make sure that you understand as well that there is no magic guarantee that your company's contributions or recommendations or efforts or test suites will be accepted. Don't guarantee that to management. Don't be like, if we start writing these patches, we can steer the direction of the Linux kernel. Be realistic. It's a community of shared participation. The best solution wins, not the solution that we spent the most money on. Now, there's a lot of statistical data that's out there that shows that customers view open source participation by companies 
as an indication of trust, expertise, and ability to provide reliable customer service for those projects and things that are built on those projects. Now, one of the ways you can have that tie back in is if your projects are openly admitting that they are using these open source components inside of them. If you are obfuscating that, that could be a challenge, and it might be worth taking that as a first step of encouraging the company to start being more open about the open source that is inside of their projects. And then you can demonstrate that, hey, not only do we use libxml, but we're actually a pretty big contributor to it. And we have a lot of expertise around that space. Adoption is huge for open source. We really do believe that when people adopt open source solutions, that it makes that open source better. It's not as good as contributing back to the open source project, but use is a big thing for communities. Nobody does open source just to have it sit on GitHub and never be used. People want it to be used. When we contribute at AWS to things like Kafka, this is, uh, this is our managed service for Apache Kafka, um, we contribute to it to make it better for the customer and to drive adoption of the technology so that when customers decide that they want to deploy it at scale, we're here. We have this option. They can use it. If they decide they don't want to, then okay, sir, sure, that's still good. Because at some point, we hope that they will get big enough that they want to come and bring it into our environment and take advantage of it at scale. And honestly, even if they're small, they're probably still going to put it on EC2, so we're still cool with that. But getting that influence in that larger space and having them see us as a good citizen to that community, it matters a lot. Because then when, we, when they're trying to make technical decisions about the direction of this project, and they're trying to decide when they want to make big changes, when they want to make breaking changes in the way that it works, do we have a seat at the table to talk with them about it? Or are they actively trying to make it harder for us to do what we do? These are the ends of the spectrum. Which one do you want to be on? Uh, there's a lot of great examples that you can point to in this. Kubernetes is a huge one. Kubernetes drives so many other projects in its ecosystem. When you earn trust in parts of the ecosystem, it transitions across. When you do good work in a sub-project, other people pay attention to that and are willing to give you the benefit of the doubt across a broader space. You don't have to participate everywhere. You can be targeted. You can be focused, especially initially. It does not have to be every dependency at our company must get deep investment from us. You can be smart about how you do this. And we talked about fun, too. I mean, open source is fun. I had sang my heart out at karaoke last night, <laughs> which is why I sound like this. Um, open source is an endless party, right? All of our lifelong friends are here. It's the best. I love all of you so much. Your company doesn't care. <laughs> but despite the fact that they said they were interested in fun in your interview, they are not. But when you talk about your open source work, it does make your employer look a little bit better. When I get up and I get to talk about the open source work that I do at AWS, people start going, well, maybe Amazon's not quite as evil as I heard they were. Hmm. Maybe. If you let people do good work in public, it signals that that's a company that lets people do good work in public. Who doesn't want to do good work in public? It builds your reputation, your resume. It's a good thing. Now, you want to be clear that you shouldn't use this as a weapon. You shouldn't hire someone with the implied promise that they'll get to be 100% on open source, because as soon as that is proven to be false when they join the company, they're going to rage quit and get on whatever Twitter is called this week and talk about how much they hate that they went to go get trapped by this evil company. And we all know that open source people might have some opinions from time to time, and they can sometimes be difficult to manage. Me, me, me. But it can be a benefit for recruitment, and that can be an angle that matters to your manager. If you're having trouble bringing in good people that you need in your company, being able to show other people that are doing good work in the open source spaces that you care about that that work is valued to that company, 
all of a sudden you have a new pool of people who might be more willing to apply for those open positions that you have. But do keep in mind that your employer really doesn't care about you building your resume. <laughs> when they say they're training you, they don't want you to ever leave. <laughs> Education is important. Gaining expertise in software that your company relies on is huge for them. Uh, getting those programming skills. But also, it's important to remember that open source is a lot about people skills, not just technical skills. Being able to work with other communities of people, being able to work with people in different time zones, with different cultural backgrounds, with different levels of expertise, with different knowledges, with different problems they're trying to solve from what you are solving. And getting experience working in these spaces is huge. It makes you a better person. It makes you a more well-rounded person. It makes you a more valuable person to your company. It helps you be a better problem solver and a better big picture thinker. And it's free. They don't have to pay for any of this training. And you get to practice on strangers on the internet, which is even better. You're not torturing your coworkers with this. And then since I said free, these are some kittens. Free is in kittens. Don't lean too hard on this point with your manager. Yes. It's free software. It's zero cost software. If that's the strongest value proposition that you have, you've already lost. Now, maybe your company and your manager is the only hook they have. If this is the only thing that will get your manager's manager to pay attention, it exists. You can go there, but that's short-term thinking, not long-term thinking. Think instead about customer value. Software is easy compared to people. People are hard. Customers come to a company because they trust the company or because they're locked into it and it's Oracle. Sorry, sorry, that was cruel. I don't mean to say that. Um, this is especially true if your product is based on open source. The people are that product. The people who build it, who maintain it, who patch it, who support it, who sell it are the product. Everything else is just a delivery mechanism. Customers today select technology first and their supplier second. It's not 1973 anymore. You don't just buy whatever IBM gives you. Participation in open source establishes expertise. When you are working in open in the technologies that your customers care about, that they have chosen to deploy, and they're trying to figure out who to deploy it with, if you are in that community, if you are driving that software, if you are improving that software, if they see you making it better and caring about it, you are going to be one of their logical choices when they try to figure out which one they want to go to. Now, is it that simple? No, but it's a factor. And it's a factor that maybe your company wasn't considering before now. And another thing, I mean, can't they just fork this? Can't we just maintain this internally? Can't we just take this whole open source problem and just have it all embedded inside of ourselves? Can't we just write our own instead? Do we really have to use this open source one? Can't we just give them a whole sack of money? Can't we just hire that smart person who's maintaining this and have them write it for us? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. They'll probably have lots of objections. They'll probably have lots of really ideas that seem brilliant to them at the time that, that they don't understand the full context for. When you're having this conversation and they're interacting back with you, be patient, be polite, be kind, don't be dismissive. Them coming back to you with questions or suggestions or ideas means they are thinking about it. They are considering it, they're trying to understand. You've gotten the foot in the door. Now you have the opportunity to have that bigger discussion. Remember that the things that you think that everyone knows will be completely foreign to the people who are outside of our open source community bubble. And each of these items could be fleshed out in an entirely different presentation. You want to take the opportunity to earn trust gradually 
with your employer. And remember that these conversations aren't going to be solved in one or two or three or four times. They're gonna happen over multiple conversations with multiple people to be impactful. Because you are going to have to be able to understand how they can see that this benefits the competition as well and why that's not necessarily a bad thing. That we don't need everything that we do to be a secret. Helping them balance out the risks and the rewards that are in play in the specific situations that involve your company. I don't know the answers to all of those things. You will. It's also not a sprint. Open source investments take a while to pay off. On average at AWS, we've seen that investments in open source take about three years to really start showing measurable differences. It takes a while to become a committer on a project, unless you're a nation state, and then you can just sort of slide right in there. <laughs> it takes a long time to master a code base, especially something that's got complexity to it. It takes a long time to change company culture and thinking and the way that we do software. Most companies are not good at being patient, especially if they have to write a quarterly earnings report. You have to be the patient one. You have to take the time. You have to be willing to fight that fight for a longer term. I could talk for days on this and give more specifics, but I don't have any more time. These are my contact informations. I'll stick around a little bit after the talk if you have specific questions. Thank you so much for your time.